down, may be excused to go downstairs. You may want to write these three passages down or put a slip of paper in each one of those areas of scripture that we will be focusing in on this morning. Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. If you do that, then as we move from passage to passage in the harmony of the gospels, that you'll be able to get there without much struggle. I received a flyer in the mail, and it was a whole number of them, and there's probably hundreds of them, of courses that you could take by DVD. You could buy the whole set, rather inexpensive, inexpensively, uh, probably say about 40 bucks for this one, 24 lessons in it, uh, taught by a professor out of University of North Carolina the historical Jesus. It sounded, you know, like an intriguing course. Uh, as I looked over the 24 lessons and the titles, the three lectures that I pulled out of it was number one, the man who became God. Became God. Not that he was God, but he became God. Lesson number seven, did Jesus think he was God? Think he was God? Lesson number 24, once Jesus became God. I uh, surmise that uh, the man who was going to teach the lessons did not believe that Jesus was God, which is not unusual. the cross, the crucifixion scene. The thing I would change about this picture in reality is where they put the nail. Probably closer to the wrist, which is part of the hand. Probably there that when the body was hanging on that cross, if it was in the hand, it could slip away and slip off. Of course, they may have put ropes, but not sure. What's happened today in our culture is that the cross has become a beautified piece of art, sold in many forms and ways, silver and gold and a lot of ways that it's presented to the public, making millions of dollars to sell crosses. The thing about the cross, however, it becomes somewhat like Buddha, actually worshiped. When I was probably 14, on the wall over my head, was a cross, a plastic cross. But I actually worshiped it as I look back. I prayed to that cross, thinking that that cross representing Jesus and God would draw me close to God and, and I would pray to it. But that's looking back. But many people pray to a cross, whether it be wood or metal. Who do you believe Jesus was? There are many that believe that he was just a deceiver, that he walked around fooling people, that he became God as the man that is going to teach that series. Most people think that he was just a man. You see, that's the difference between reality of accepting Christ. If we accept him just as a good man, a good prophet, that's not salvation. We have come to that point in our lives where we believe that he was God, is God, and will forever be God. 
we don't come to that point that he is God and that we confess him as Lord, as we would say Jehovah. We will come to the point that he really never existed. Because the meaning and purpose of Jesus' coming was to come and die for your sins and my sins in order that we might have eternal life. Yeah, too fast. You gotta press it slowly. There we go. Floyd knows all about this. There are two acts of love that Jesus needed to fulfill to prove that he was God's gift to this world. If these two acts of love are not fulfilled, he would never have come to that point of being able to do what he claims that he is going to do. And the first, I think, act was to stay on the cross. I want you to turn, if you would, to John chapter 19. I want you to see the story unfolding before us. We find in verse 18 following, there they crucified him with him two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. So you see the three crosses on the hill in the background. You see those three crosses, sorry, not on a hill, but down in that rock quarry. And the centered cross is Jesus. The two crosses on the outside represent the cross of two criminals, two robbers, as the scriptures talk about. And it says here in verse 19, these are Pilate's words. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. We find here, as you look back in this very same chapter, go back to verse 14, if you would, in the same chapter. It says, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, this is Pilate speaking, behold, your king. Sarcasm, not reality. Trying to take and cause the Jewish leaders to get angry, to be fulfilled of envy. Verse 15 says, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate says to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. What a interaction of words and Pilate's words were very clear and as he writes as we find here and puts the sign over the top of the cross or maybe under the cross where Jesus hung Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews as the viewers go by in verse 20 it says many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Three different languages, no matter who passed by, no matter whether it was a visitor that understood Greek and could read Greek, or Latin, or Hebrew. They, were, they would be able to read the very words that Pilate had written. Again, he was rubbing it in to the Jewish leaders. He was not trying to be nice. He wasn't trying to be polite. He was trying to be aggravating them because they were aggravating him. In fact, you understand that Pilate came to the realization that there was nothing that Jesus did that was deserving of crucifixion or to be killed. But they kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And this was Pilate's way of getting back. Verse 21 so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, and probably in private, do not write the king of the Jews, 
but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. You see, they were, they, they were angry because the sign read, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. No, 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 no. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. You see, again, he claimed to be God. He claimed to be king. He claimed to be the Messiah. And we didn't want any part of that. They rejected him as the Messiah king. Verse 22, Pilate finishes it out by saying, what I have written, I have written. It's going to stand that way. I'm not going to change my mind on it. I want you to look with me and hold your finger there to Isaiah chapter 53. The fulfillment of prophecy. Some 500 plus years before Jesus comes and walks upon this planet. Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Talking about the Jewish people, talking about the Jewish Savior, the crucified one that's hanging on the cross right now as we read the story from John. Understand that Jesus was rejected by men. He was not accepted. He was not loved. He was despised. People did not walk around and say, hey, you know, I know this Jesus man. Mm -mm. I have nothing to do with him. And that's the way people felt about him. Second aspect I want you to look at is in Mark. Chapter 15. He must stay on the cross in order to be our Savior, in order, in order to die for us on the cross for our sins. We find that there are mockers that are coming. They're going to come and they're going to take and, and laugh at him, spit at him, whatever they want to do. Like you to look at verse 29. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They were mocking him, laughing at him. As we read on, it says, So the chief priests also with the scribes mocked him to one another and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who crucified him, uh, were crucified with him, also reviled him, were sarcastic. They also joined in the crowd. See, this is where this all starts in the whole aspect of Jesus dying on that cross. The religious leaders are taken in throwing in their two cents and trying to deride Jesus Christ. We find that Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 is the purpose of Jesus coming to this earth. The angel Gabriel told Joseph, you shall call his name, what? Jesus, and he shall save his, what? His people from their sins. See, in order for Jesus to fulfill his mission, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, all were laughing and mocking at him. They were all putting their two cents in and trying to cause the whole crowd to come with them and say, you know, he's not a king, he's just man. And so they diminished him and said, well, you come down from the cross, he's come down from the cross and we'll believe. But no, his purpose was to stay on the cross and he had to stay on that cross. In the book of Mark, and you're already in Mark if you are there, chapter 15, I'd like you to back up to chapter nine. Mark chapter nine. And this is one of a number of times that Jesus shared with his disciples this very story or these very facts. 
Verse 30. It says in verse 30 of chapter 9, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, Listen to his words. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But notice verse 32. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him about what he just told them. He prophesied to his own disciples saying, you know, this is what's going to happen to me. This is how people are going to deal with me. They're going to take and they're going to beat me. They're going to insult me. They're going to put me on a cross. They're going to crucify me. They're going to kill me, take my life from me. He had to stay on the cross. He could not come down from that cross. The question that I ask is, who truly crucified Jesus Christ? The Roman soldiers responsible? The Jewish priests and people that were there that day responsible? Crucifixion was a fact, it's a reality. The answer is you and me. We crucified him. If we do not internalize that, if we do not take responsibility for Jesus' death, we've missed the point of coming to Grace Bible Church. You've missed the point of reading your Bible. You've missed the point of Christianity. Do you understand what I'm saying? You must internalize what Jesus Christ did for you and me. I put him on that cross. I crucified him. You crucified him if you know him as your savior. Every person in this world that has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ the Savior are the crucifiers of this Son of God, Son of Man. When we start to take responsibility of crucifying Jesus Christ ourselves, it will make a difference in our lives. Understand, and please understand this very clearly, it is not knowing the facts. It's not knowing that Jesus had nails driven through his hands and his feet. It's not knowing that he had a crown of thorns. It's not knowing that he was scourged. It's not knowing that he had his beard plucked. It is not knowing that he went through the ordeal of dying for us, for me. It has to become a personal crucifixion. You must accept responsibility for the death of Jesus Christ. Notice what the scriptures say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Understand, the wages of sin is death. Jesus did not deserve to die on a cross. In fact, he didn't deserve to die at all. If he never died on the cross for our sins, he would still be walking on planet Earth. He'd be 2,000 plus years old and he'd still be walking around on planet Earth talking and preaching and whatever else he wanted to do. You need to understand, he chose to take your place and my place on the cross. I don't know about you. I think about going into a city of Jerusalem and have the people, the Jews, do the very same thing to me. I'm not sure I'd sleep too well knowing that for a long, long time. 
having to realize that they're going to beat me and spit at me and call me all kinds of names, mock me, and then I would have to be nailed to a cross for something I deserve. My sins. I, I look at that foot, one on top of the other, and the nail driven through both of them. Hmm. I get a hangnail, and that's bad. And this excruciating pain. Understand the reality of our personal involvement in the crucifixion. That's why we sang this, the song, The Power of the Cross. There's great power in that cross because it takes and has the potential of delivering you and saving you and rescuing you from all your sins forever. Remember, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When he died, and when we trust him as our personal Savior, we die with him symbolically. Because he died in my place. But it's not until I put my faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ is that transaction made. He became sin for me that knew no sin. Notice what the rest of the verse says, that I might become his righteousness. That's not a very fair transaction. I give Jesus my sins and I receive his righteousness and I stand before God holy and without sin. He took my sin away from me. In Psalm it says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my sins from me. I will never have to face my sins again. All my sins, no matter how dirty and filthy and rugged they are in my life. All my sins are washed clean from me personally and from you who have it accepted Christ as your Savior. You see the power of the cross, the power of what Jesus Christ did. It's not the wood that saves us. It's the person that it represents, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God who came to this world inside of the womb of Mary and nine months later became a little baby who eventually grew up and was ready to face this crucifixion. No, you need to understand, if Jesus did come down from that cross that day to prove to a few Jewish people and those that passed by that he was the Savior and the Son of God, we'd still be in our sins. He had to stay on the cross. And because he did, you and I that have put our faith and trust in him are forever forgiven. And we sang that song this morning that because of what he did, he demands our life, our all. And truly, that's exactly what we need to feel and sense and desire to do. The second act that we find in the Word of God, I believe, is the fact that Jesus must forgive sinners. Jeremiah said it so well. He didn't come to die for righteous people. People that say, well, I'm, I'm good enough to get to heaven. If I do enough good works, it'll outweigh the bad works and I'll be okay. Or because I believe in God, that's enough. Mm -hmm. There has to be a forgiveness of sins. 
I'd like you to go to the book of Luke, please. Chapter 23. I want you to view verse 33. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 34. And Jesus says, as he hangs on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. We walked around on this planet for a while. Some of you got saved when you were a kid. Some of you were saved when you were a teen. Some of you were saved when you were adults. Some of you were saved later on in your life. It really doesn't matter, but this does matter. All of us walked around in the ignorance of our sin. You say, well, you mean, are we saying that I didn't know that I was sinning? Well, you could call it sin if you want. When you stole the candy bar, when you stole this, when you hated someone, when you called people dirty names, when you blasphemed God, Whatever you did in your early life before you were a Christian, yeah, you, you did all of those things. And God watched you. And God did not approve of any of them. But you walked around thinking that this is the way life goes. In fact, that's the way your friends lived. That's the way they talked, the way they thought, the way they practiced, what they believed. And they didn't believe in God for sure. I don't know about you, but my friends didn't. Had high schoolers. I don't know that any of them had any faith in Jesus Christ. I do not remember one person. I'd say, well, you know, I think maybe, maybe one. But you need to understand, we walked around in our sins, and we were ignorant of what we were doing. We were oblivious about the fact that we were offending a holy God. Oh, we may have believed in a God, but it was not the God of the Bible, because if we understand the God of the Bible, we understand that he is holy, pure, and without sin, and that the things that we do are offending him. But you know what the Word of God says? We don't understand. We don't seek him. Romans chapter 3 tells us very clearly. Jesus was praying. It says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's talking about the Romans. He's talking about the Jewish priests and the Jewish people that were there. And he was really saying, you know, they really don't know what they're doing in crucifying me. They don't understand that what I am doing, I'm doing for the sins of the people of the whole world. They don't understand that I am the Son of God, that I am God himself in this human body, and I'm here for the very purpose of dying for the sins of the world. So when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he was really saying the truth, and he was really releasing them, because as we've said before, we crucified him. Not those human beings that were alive on that day in probably 29 AD. We find here, that the criminals reviled Jesus. We saw that in a previous passage. That is, they were laughing and they were mocking. But, but here's the thing. The criminals that were there, one of them as we find here, look in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. One of the criminals was selfish, totally self-centered, saying, you know, hey, if you're really the Christ, then, you know, do this. Get me off the cross here and save me from this death and save yourself too. 
He wanted it that way. Verse 40. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The second criminal was reviling him at the beginning, and now he changes his mind. I'm not sure when he did that. I tried to put the pieces together and try to figure out exactly. Was it during the hours of darkness? Was it after the hours of darkness? Was it before the hours of darkness that this all happened and transpired? Really doesn't matter. The issue is that when he was hung on the cross with the other criminal, they both were attacking Jesus with words. But someplace, at some point, this man said, Whoa, this, this one that's hanging right here is different than anybody I've, I've ever heard or seen in my life. Maybe he heard the words of Jesus when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, and, and the, he says, forgiveness of these people? They don't know what they're doing. To, boy, they know what they're doing with me. And I'm not sure what, the way it all transpired, but this man started to think again about his situation, think again about the issue of this man that was hanging on the cross and, and now defends Jesus to the other guy who's on the other side of Jesus and he yells out to him, you know, hey, don't you fear God? Don't you understand? We are here justly. We've robbed. We've done our things wrong. The government's crucifying us. But this guy, uh-uh. He's clean. He's without sin. He's not here because he's committed a crime. A change of heart. But he goes on as we read here. Verse 42. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, not only was the criminal changing his mind, but he is realizing that this is a Messiah, maybe the Messiah. And we don't know if the criminals were Jewish or not. I assume they are, because this guy is saying a kingdom, and he's heard this message. He's probably been in Jerusalem long enough. He's heard about Jesus and preaching about the kingdom of God. And he says, this is the one. He says, listen. I've changed my mind about you. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. I'm not going to escape this death on the cross. It's already done. I'm going to die in a few hours. But when the kingdom that you have is going to come, I want you to remember me. Notice what Jesus says in verse 43. And he says to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what transpired in that moment of time? Jesus forgave him of his sins. Jesus promised him eternal life. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter how sinful and bad and wicked you've been in your past. God is willing to forgive you of your sins. I've heard it over and over again. Well, God could never forgive me. You don't know how bad of a life I've lived. Especially guys that come out of the armed forces. Many of them are filled with guilt about the fact that they've had to kill people because they've had to do things that consciously they shouldn't have, but their officer said, you do it. It's just the way it is. 
there are people that I've talked to that have been part of the mafia, people that I've talked to that have been into horrendous sin. And they told me, I, I can't be forgiven. I says, my God is super in, in, invested in you and he's given everything for you in order that you might have the forgiveness of sins. You see, the forgiveness of sins is essential in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, for me. This is powerful. Do you understand? I don't know where you are and what you think. You know, some, some people say, you know, I, I believe in Jesus as my Savior, but you know, I've been so bad, I, I'm not sure. I want you to understand this morning that be sure. Be assured of the fact that He has forgiven you of every sin in your life. Here was this criminal on the cross that's changing his moment of time and he's going to change his mind and, and God promises him through Jesus, you're going to be with me in paradise today. So when the kingdom is coming, the criminal's going to be there. You need to understand that God wants to make a promise to you of eternal life. And he does it because he loves you and cares about you. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to just tell you the story about the paralytic and the four men. You probably know the story already very well. And there were four men that were carrying a man on a bed or a pallet. And they were carrying him to bring him to Jesus because he couldn't move. He, he was paralyzed. But they believed that Jesus could heal this man. And so they brought him to the house where Jesus was. And as they got to the house, they saw they weren't getting in with this dude. Nobody was moving. Nobody was moving out of their place, man. They were stuck where they are. You know, have you ever been to a, a place like a fireworks or something and you want to get, you know, closer? And nobody's going to let you through, man. I'm not, I'm not moving my place, man. I I'm, I'm just I'm got this close and I'm staying here. And that's the way they were. They were fixed on what Jesus was teaching. I'm not sure. I, I thought about this. How in the world did they know where Jesus was in the house unless maybe one of the four guys was probably living in that house? And so they go up the staircase. They go up on the roof. And they start tearing the roof apart. These roof tiles, I'm saying. Man, it sounds pretty dangerous to me, but, you know, I, I, what am I? And then they tore the roof apart, and then they take some ropes, and then they let the man down right in front of Jesus. Goes right down on the floor. And Jesus is watching. He, he's probably hearing all of this stuff going on, and he just keeps on teaching and preaching, you know. And everybody else is sort of, oh, what's happening? Uh, they're oblivious to the teaching now. I mean, they're more concerned about this happening, this event that's happening right in front of them. And they're looking, and all of a sudden, they see all this stuff coming down. And they stand and wait, and then they see this body come down right in front of Jesus. And the religious leaders especially are paying attention. And Jesus looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. Now I'm going to tell you something. The people that were there that were Jews say, how in the world is he going to forgive sin? Only God can forgive sins. This, this is only a man. Jesus says, you think forgiving sins, just telling a person that their sins are forgiven is, is a big deal? She says, I'll show you that the Son of Man has the authority and the ability to forgive sins. He says to the man, stand up, arise, and go home. And right in front of all these people, he gets up, he goes home. And they say, oh, we've seen extraordinary things this day. You see, it wasn't the healing that was the big deal, was it? It was the forgiving of sins. Do you understand? 
the sins of this man were released. They were let go. He stands before God without sin. Jesus forgives us as far as the east is from the west. Jesus gives us peace and joy of the Spirit. Things happen. We change. We avoid God's condemnation to hell. We enjoy heaven forever one day, and it's coming. That's our hope. Are you a Christian here this morning? Do you have the assurance that when you die, that you will go to heaven? And one of the things that we talked about with Annie, how are you doing? Walking through this valley in your life where you're weak and you can't get around. And she knows, I really think she knows she's on her last months of life, maybe last weeks of life. It's so important to know, to realize that you are a Christian, that you are saved, that you have this assurance and peace that only comes from God. And it doesn't come because we're good people. It comes because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. I hope you're ready for heaven. I hope that you know that your sins are all forgiven and that you have the Savior and you know a Savior, and his name is Jesus because he's the only one that can give you that life and give you that change of heart because he's the one who died for you on the cross. I'm so thankful that I have a Savior. 53 years ago today, in the spring of the year like this, I went to a meeting and I heard the gospel and it was preached very well and I understood, and the brain had a clear understanding of truth, and I became a Christian. It has changed my life, and God's been changing me for the last 53 years of life. And God offers the same to you. If you really don't understand, if you really have not come to the point to believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, today is the day. Don't put it off another day. I'd like the worship team to come up as we sing a song called There is a Redeemer. You know, I am so glad that there is a Redeemer, one who has paid the price. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, my, O oh my Father, for giving to us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. You know, God's given me so much as a believer in Jesus Christ. May you enjoy his presence in your heart and life. Let's stand. Let's worship him.